If a person has lost all of their memory of their past experiences, you know, would they have the same experience of consciousness or would they have to relearn everything and have the same life experiences to actually be the same person? Hmm. Yeah, I think, well, there are some, there are some real world examples of this. I and mean, well, there's some cinematic ones too. I always go back to cinema as a first step. So I think you may have seen the film Memento, which is a great example of, of someone who's lost all their memory and tries to reconstruct not only what happened, but, but who they are too. And um, you know, this, this kind of selective, but very comprehensive loss of memory, it's, it's pretty rare, but, but it mm. does happen. Uh, and, and there are these two types of amnesia, actually. There's, there's, and they often go together. There's, there's a retrograde amnesia, which is you, you lose memories of the past, but you can still lay down new memories. But perhaps mm. the more distressing one is anterograde amnesia, where you can no longer lay down any new memories. Mm. And that's when you you sort of see this very the strange ways in which it's not the same person, but it is the same person. So there's this case, the famous case of a, a guy called Clive Wearing, who was who had a, a brain disease and encephalopathy in the 1980s in the UK, and he emerged from that with one of the most profound anterograde amnesias that's ever been described. Since then, he's never really been able to lay down new memories. I believe he's still alive. So this has been going on for a very long time. Um, his wife, Deborah, described him as living in this permanent present tense. And, um, and so he would keep a diary. And in his diary, he would always cross out repeated entries uh, that said, I'm now awake for the first time. I'm now awake for the very first time. And they would all be crossed out. And I'm now alive, awake for the first time ever. Uh, so certainly part of his sense of self was was obliterated. He had no continuity of his personal identity. But in the moment, he was expressing a personality that was was quite continuous with what had gone before. And the, the one of the most moving examples of that was when he used to be a, a musician and a musicologist and a conductor of a choir. And at one point after his illness, he was taken back to his choir and he conducted them fluently. The music still fell from him as fluently as it always did. Uh, but then when he got back to his, the hospital or wherever he was staying, you know, he, he had no memory of that happening at all. So we can lose parts of the self while still retaining others. And you know, I, many of us are familiar with this in, in, in less sort of dramatic circumstances w with relatives that might have dementia or things like that you know there's this gradual chipping away but you know everybody will tell you that elements of that person are still very much the same way they always were and just down to the basics people with amnesia or, or dementia typically don't have problems with their sense of first person perspective or what is their body or of making a voluntary action so these elements of selfhood can be preserved completely intact even when we lose things that we may be more used to um, associating with selfhood, which is like, who am I as a person over time? Do you think it's because these, uh, I guess, these pathways in our brain are so well worn, just like our oldest memories are the last ones to be lost if we have dementia? Do you think this might be why we still are able to retain our sense of identity in those situations? Could be, yeah. I mean, it, it certainly seems that... Um, experiences of embodiment and volition are I mean they there are conditions where they get uh, altered or obliterated as well but it's certainly much rarer than the the attrition of, of memory over time and I guess that I think you might be you might be onto something there that see once you once you've developed a sense of ownership over actions really that doesn't have to change much over time I mean that's that's going to be a stable part of your your life uh, for as long as you live but memory accumulation by its nature is a dynamic thing you always it doesn't work unless you it's open to change you have to be able to remember new things and forget old things as well so it may be intrinsically a more fragile aspect of the architecture of self mm -hmm. what happens if we start hacking it for example with psychedelic drugs <laughs> <laughs> okay, no idea i mean it's quite, it's fascinating that, um, you know, can we actively shape our perception of the world i think is what i'm trying to say oh, yeah i mean and, and 
so yeah, psychedelic drugs is one way to do that for sure. And, and there's actually this increasing uh, resurgence of, of research using psychedelics because for the longest time, for generations, well, since the 60s, really, it, it's been pretty much outlawed from scientific and medical research. And uh, fortunately, that's a situation which is now changing because uh, th these are these are compounds which they I mean, they have a very specific and selective effect on the nervous system. They, uh, they tend to activate the serotonin system or subparts of the serotonin system, and they dramatically change experiences of the, the world and of the self. And so as a window into the brain basis of consciousness, they are hugely informative and increasing evidence is emerging that they're, great, they're very effective in, in psychiatric treatment as well, especially for things like treatment-resistant depression. And you can see why, because, you know, very colloquially, a problem with, let's say, something like depression is you get locked into a, an entrenched, vicious circle of perceiving the world and the self to be a particular way that then, that then sets your behavior down tram lines that reinforces those negative perceptions and beliefs. Um, and you know, suddenly having an intervention that reveals to you that the way you perceive the world is a construction you know, is one way of knocking you out of those tram lines. Now, that's a story. There's no evidence that that's actually the mechanism by which psychedelics actually have their effect. But it, it opens up a very, very interesting and rich um, program of research. And it's much more, to me, much more uh, fascinating than the old story about, let's say, SSRIs and depression, which is just say, oh, you haven't got enough serotonin in your brain, so let's let's top it up. I mean, it doesn't really explain very much about depression or why it should work. And indeed, SSRIs in general don't yeah. work that well. Or why it takes them two weeks to start working, even though the effects of the drug are immediate. Yeah, That's I think right. it's really, yeah, yeah. really interesting in that, um, you know, when we also think about psychedelic drugs, there's, there's, I guess, a blossoming of neuroplasticity immediately following the use of those drugs. So perhaps that's also helping these differences in perception to be um, explored by the brain and therefore altering consciousness going forward.